The last wave of prophetic writings that we have addresses the disappointment and the disillusionment of the late 6th and 5th century Judeans. What was the message of these writings? The basic message was that the earlier prophets, their promises of future glory for the restored remnant, these were all true. The future just isn't now. It's only going to happen in the eschaton, the final day. Only then will the glory of Jerusalem and a messianic ruler be restored. And the hope that has to sustain the community through the bleak present is therefore an eschatological hope, a hope that focuses on an ideal account of the end, eschatology an account of the end. Because in the end of days, everything will be set right. So as we move later into the period, we find increasingly the hope for the community is thrust off into the future in an eschatology. Parts of third Isaiah depict the bitter reality of life in post-exilic Judah and advance an eschatology. You remember the book of Isaiah, which is 66 chapters. We divide into three parts, 1 through 39, which is the historical Isaiah. Then we have second Isaiah and then third Isaiah we're dealing with now. That's chapters 56 to 66. The anonymous prophetic author of these chapters denounces the failings of the exiles but does hold out an eschatology, a doctrine of final things that depicts what's going to happen in the end of days. This kind of eschatology differs from the depiction of Zion's future glory that we had in the early classical prophets. The earlier prophetic pronouncements generally referred to a reestablishment of Judah's fortunes in historical time. But eschatological works, like Third Isaiah, look beyond historical time. They're looking to a time of a new heaven and a new earth, when Judah's sins will be forgotten. The land will become an earthly paradise, transformed and blessed with peace and prosperity and length of days. This is from Isaiah 65, verses 17 to 25. For behold, I am creating a new heaven and a new earth, the former things shall not be remembered, they shall never come to mind. Be glad then, and rejoice forever in what I am creating, for I shall create Jerusalem as a joy, and her people as a delight. Never again shall there be heard, shall be heard there the sounds of weeping and wailing. No more shall there be an infant or graybeard who does not live out his days. He who dies at a hundred years shall be reckoned a youth, and he who fails to reach a hundred shall be reckoned accursed. For the days of my people shall be as long as the days of the tree. My chosen ones shall outlive the work of their hands. They shall not toil to no purpose. They shall not bear children for terror. But they shall be a people blessed by the Lord, and their offspring shall remain with them. Before they pray, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will respond. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the serpent's food shall be earth. In all my sacred mount, nothing evil or vile shall be done, said the Lord. You see this interesting notion of a completely new, transformed heaven and earth. The lion is vegetarian again. The serpent no longer is. There's not this animosity between the serpent and humans, as was decreed at the end of Genesis with the curse on the serpent. They're going to just be eating earth, and there will be no, no danger. 